tell you a little bit about the fossil fuel industry and where we're going after that. And after that, it's kind of creeping up on us now. But there will be a need for oil and gas for your lifetime and for your children's lifetime. It's not going to be happening quickly. But the problem with oil and gas is that they are, as you know, becoming more and more expensive. And the more expensive they get, the more competitive the alternatives become. So I will spend some time on how it is we go out and do this. You may not have much concept of how you look for and get out of the ground oil and natural gas. A little bit about why it costs so much. And uh, that's something you see in the paper every day. You know, we're in the only business where the price of our product is on every street corner. So it's always in the public mind. And you need an answer to why it costs so much. And then some of the technologies we use now and some of the ones we're investing in for the future. And then these things called our alternatives. Are they really alternatives? And do we need all of them? Absolutely, the answer to that is yes. And then at the end, I want some feedback from you. And I'd like you to be thinking about myths or misconceptions or statements you've heard about the oil and gas industry. And I'll try and address those if you have issues you'd like to bring up. So the first thing is, in everybody's mind, it starts with an idea. That's where it all begins. We don't go out with anything in the way of data until we've got an idea that we ought to be looking in that area. So I've got to have a strategy. Do I want to find oil or do I want to find natural gas? For most of my career, gas has been the failure case. If we drill into a gas reservoir, we say, oops, and go home. But more recently, that has become the alternative for environmentally preferable. It's a clean burning product. And now we have the technology to liquefy it and put it in tankers and move it around the globe. But until recently, it's been what's called stranded gas. We have found it. It's big. It's on the north slope of Alaska. It's in the Middle East. There's no way to get it to America. So that was not considered a target at the time. The other big strategy issue is do I want a quick return on my money or do I want something big that's going to last for 40 years? So I start with the concept, well, if I'm out there exploring, it's different than if I'm developing. Because if I'm developing something that's already been found, and the technique then becomes, how do I get it out of the ground, usually the most rapid and cost-effective way I can do it. If I'm exploring, that means I'm out there looking. And here's a question for you. If I'm building in a new place in the world, what do you think my chance of success is? Who's guessing? I would guess it's pretty high. Because you wouldn't take the investment to go and drill there unless you had some pretty yeah. research. The investment part is right. The, the return is not. Any other guesses? <laughs> it's 5 to 10%. And this is the only business that I know you can be wrong 95% of the time and still make money. <laughs> okay? That's because the rewards are big. If you do find it, and it's big, then we've got uh, a company maker. So the first question is, is it really there? And we go and look at rocks that are outcropping that might be analogs to the ones under the surface of the Earth. We do a lot of regional studies. And in the Middle East, this is where I've been working most recently, we know that the most prospective reservoir rocks are in a band that runs right through there. So Qatar is a good place. Kuwait is a good place. Parts of Saudi Arabia are a good place. No surprise to that. We look at other people who have drilled wells, or wells that we might have drilled 50 years ago see what we can learn from those. We make a lot of maps, and we study a lot of published maps, and we make a lot of cross-sections. Each one of these little wiggles is a different well, and we tie those together with the seismic data showing us what's happening between the wells. And then the seismic data itself, and that's where you make a noise and you listen to the echo. And the echo comes back one, two, three, four, five seconds later, and you wind up in 3D space making those into surfaces that are doing the reflections. And if you are recording the original data, it may come back like that. But there's some processing things you can do to make it in more detail like that. If you're on land, you've got all kinds of surface complications. There are soil zones, there are caves, there's weathered soil, there's all kinds of stuff. But if you're in the ocean, it's a continuous medium. So you send the sound down through the water, through the mud, into the rock layers, and it comes back. So marine data is usually much more detailed. And then we get into risk. And I want you to know the difference between uncertainty and risk. Risk is something that we cannot change. We can quantify it by studying it. 
but we cannot alter it. It's part of the natural process. So we've got these kinds of risks we deal with all the time. There's the natural risk, economic risk. You know, just because we found it doesn't mean it's commercial. You have to have a big enough accumulation in the right kind of rock that we're going to get it out. Political risk, well, we've seen that in many parts of the world. In Venezuela, my company and ExxonMobil just had all their assets taken away. And that's not a real comfortable feeling. And you wind up ultimately in the world court saying they owe us $360 billion or something like that. And usually, in the world court, the companies win because I don't know how many of you are friends with Hugo Chavez, but it was literally taken away without any compensation. <coughs> Risk can be quantified. As I said, our chance of drilling what we call a ranked wildcat well in some place we've never drilled before, that risk of commercial success is only about 5 to 10 percent. And we cannot control risk. Our risk is the chance of something good happening. If you're an engineer, you understand risk as something bad happening. <laughs> the airplane falls over the edge, the bridge falls down, the building collapses. That's an engineering risk, but our risk is risking success. So that's the five or ten percent I'm talking about. I want to contrast that with uncertainty. That's what we don't know. And sometimes we're aware that we don't know it, and sometimes we're not aware that we don't know it. And uncertainty, we can throw more people and money at the problem, and we can minimize uncertainty. And as you probably know, there comes a point at which you'd rather take the risk and not spend any more money gathering data. And some companies are risk averse or toward that end of the project of the spectrum. Some companies are willing to be way out there on the edge taking risks. And usually it's the young upstart entrepreneurial companies that are out there taking the big risks.